Thanks very much for having me. So I'm the founder of both the uh, Shorty Awards and Muckrack, uh, our holding company. Uh, that I started is called uh, Sawhorse Media and Shorty Awards Muckrack are the two products out of it. So I'll jump into this all shortly, but first I you know, just wanted to say it's great to be around a bunch of other minds and staffs. Muckrack we've built up now to be one of the leading uh, SaaS products for the PR community. So it's used by public relations pros, entrepreneurs, ranging from startups like BuzzFeed, DocDoc, Flipboard, all the way to agencies like Edelman, Weber, Shanwick, companies like Tepsi, MasterCard, etc. And funny enough, on the flip side, I'd, uh, I just tweeted out a link to this on the hashtag, but a few months ago I was looking at our credit card bill and I noticed just how many staff apps we had. And so I just copy and pasted and posted it into a blog post. So I actually list out every piece of stats we use and how much we're spending on every one of them. But uh, today I want to talk to you more at the top of the funnel. We built our business for now 25 people, almost completely bootstrapped. We've never taken any institutional money. And one of the things that really let us do that was both social media and PR. It was generating a lot of attention what we were doing with the Shorty Award and the Muckrack. So we had a tremendous amount of inbound leads coming to us, and that kind of let us save a lot on marketing and sales costs, especially early on, so we could kind of time the pump and get revenue going. So I'm going to tell you our story first, but then I'm going to go into a lot of tips on how you can do PR too. Even if you're not a PR person, you've never done it before, but how to generate media attention to kind of drive that interest into your business. So this is how I got started about 10 years ago. I, I was a lifelong entrepreneur. I started my first business in high school, and I was curious how other people did it. So I started a podcast in 2005, back before the term of podcasting even took off. And on it, I interviewed anyone from, uh, I interviewed Reed Hoffman back when LinkedIn was 30 people, uh, Scott Eichmann from Meetup back when Meetup was uh, kind of just getting going, <coughs> founders of Yelp, PayPal, uh, dozens of others. And this is one of the uh, interviews that I did that kind of led me into it. This is Found Audio, circa 2005. Uh, does it sound working off this, or should I um, Ow, need the whole system? Wow. All right, let's get to how are you thinking big now with audio? That's a good question. I, I think we're thinking big, and we're thinking audio is everywhere. It's the most ubiquitous medium there is, and we want to be the best source for for finding and subscribing and you know, listening to audio as well as creating it. And we have lots of big ideas around that and we're not trying to, we're trying to be a one-stop shop that does lots of different things and as well as being open at the same time, uh, make lots of stuff free and, and as easy as possible for tens of millions of users. That's except for my podcast. Does anyone know who that is? What entrepreneur had big dreams for audio in the back? Is that Ed? Yep, and Williams of Odeo at the time. So I was interviewing him for my podcast. I was doing a lot in the podcasting world. And uh, they launched Odeo, goes completely sideways, way too early for the podcasting world. But they started a little side project that I signed up for called Twitter. This is what it looked like back before they could afford the vowels. It was TWTPR. Later, they scrounged together up. It was ten thousand dollars to buy Twitter.com from a bird enthusiast. But I signed up for Twitter back in those days. I was able to get at Gregory. Didn't have to call in any favors. Just no other Gregory's thought to go for the first name yet. And I thought logged up for Twitter at first. I thought it was such a bad idea. I didn't upload my photo. And I still haven't. But over the time that I was on Twitter, I saw there was all this great stuff going on. There was great people making content uh, about software, technology, sports news but no way to find who was interesting. So we thought, hey, could we crowdsource this and get people on Twitter to tell us who's good under the guise of an award? So in the course of two weekends, we built the first ever voting software on Twitter. So you could simply vote with a tweet. You could tweet out, I nominate at so-and-so, and make a real-time leaderboard out of it. We had a $10 marketing budget, which is what it cost to buy the main name on GoDaddy. So we bought shortywords.com since tweets are short. And we launched it. And uh, I've launched many things in my life. And up until this point, we were working on other things that we thought would be a real serious business. 
Uh, of anything I've launched, there was never anything I launched that I had less potential that I thought had less potential to be a business prior to launch than the Shorty Awards. <laughs> Yet launching the Shorty Awards in 24 hours, it became the top trending term on Twitter. And after that, we had this kind of holy shit moment. People actually didn't want to come to this thing. We had no backgrounds in events, but we scrambled together in two months to put on the first Shorty Awards. We just since expanded it to be all the best in social media, both for brands and individuals. I have a two minute clip from the show here to play to you now. No more like an Oscar or um, a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, better, probably. Broadway has the Tonys, Hollywood has the Oscars, and now social media has the Shorties. Welcome everyone to the seventh annual Shorty Award. The Shorties are by far the most prestigious. We are so proud to be part of the Shorty Awards. Thank you, Shorty Awards. Thank you for doing that. That was uh, pretty cool. I get a call, I gotta be at the Shorty Awards. I'll speak from the heart. Wow, that was awesome. There is not a more passionate fan base out there. Hi, friends. What's up? Hey, some Best Singer Award. I really appreciate that. I share this Shorty with so many people, most especially the children who help make it possible. Hey, honey, you know the Shorty Awards? Yeah. Jimmy Kimmel just won one. What? <laughs> oh, something like the Oscars! Well, I think that, you know, people that indulge in narcissistic behavior of talking out into the internet need to be acknowledged for that. Fellow <laughs> <laughs> well, narcissists. By the way, I want to mention that I did keep my acceptance speech to 140 characters. You all have one thing in common, and that is your parents don't understand what you do. Thank you so much, Shorty Awards, for giving me the best YouTube comedian award. I'm assuming it's because you don't have most ratchet hot mess as a category. Yeah. Thank you. On behalf of the NBA, thank you so much for this surprisingly heavy award. I just really want to thank you for honoring me with the Shorty Award. This is very cool. I'm so excited. This is the only award in my office that I actually display, and uh, I'm just really proud of it. Thank you for this Shorty Award. Hashtag Shorty Awards. Oh, you guys, this is really fun. This is big fun, yes? You pronounce it GIF? Because I say, I say GIF. I feel like everyone I know says GIF. There's no awards for tiny people, you know? It finally gives them the recognition they deserve. <laughs> wow. Shorty Awards in two minutes. What, what struck us though with the Shorty Awards was that that first year we did it, this was late 2008, uh, the ceremony was in early 2009. We'd taken off on Twitter first, uh, but Twitter wasn't even all that big back then. Yet we saw that we got a tremendous amount of inbound press attention. Within 24 hours, we had the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, BBC, all email us and ended up getting uh, write ups in all these publications and many more. And that was despite not having any kind of press strategy, whereas I've been involved in many other launches where you launch a company and nobody cares, and you struggle over the course of years to get the media to take you seriously. So what we saw was that the journalists were using social media really early on, not just to contact their friends, but to do their jobs, to figure out who to pitch, to connect with their colleagues, uh, to get story ideas. So that led us to create Muckrack. Originally, it's just a site we could see all the journalists on social media. But then a few years later, we relaunched it as a SaaS platform. So that we do kind of three things at the core. Help you find journalists. We index every article written by every journalist and every tweet sent by every journalist. So that you can see, hey, if I'm, this is a slide of a MasterCard, which journalist written about me. So if I'm doing my next launch, what what would be my pitch, or if I were going after small businesses, I could search for which journalists tweet and write the most stories about small businesses, make a press list, and then actually get their email right through our system, email them to get the press pitch. Then we also do alerts, so that notifies you the moment you're mentioned in an article, <coughs> and then you can a journalist, so you can react really quickly, and we have Google alerts a lot of the times. I think that Google has now put most of their uh, entrepreneurs and self-driving cars, leaving Google Works products a little understaffed. And then finally create reports to see the impact of all the press we've had. With that, what I want to get into is how do you actually get press? So I think a lot of us in this room, we're not the PR people ourselves, but we run companies, we run marketing, we work with agencies, we hire PR people. 
and sometimes we're just going to launch something on our own. And one of the great things about <laughs> this function is anyone can do it. You don't have to be uh, a genius. You don't have to have deep industry experience, but just through some kind of common sense outreach, not that unlike sales, you can reach out and get press for what you're doing. Yet a lot of people do it wrong, and even when you hire agencies, uh, you'll see a lot of times professionals were kind of brought up in a different era, or, or kind of take shortcuts on how to do it. So they do these kind of mass blasts to press, and you know, we've all seen it where you have kind of a failed press launch, and you feel like you've done everything right, yet you don't have any results. So what I want to talk about here is, is the survey we did of journals actually hearing how they like to be pitched kind of what we can take out of that to be successful ourselves. So first of all, we surveyed what social networks do journalists use the most. And we found, uh, whereas here, you know, we might say to really kind of show our professional, <coughs> we're probably more forward thinking here, so maybe a little bit less. But I'd say most professionals would say LinkedIn is where I keep my professional presence. And maybe I use uh, Facebook to keep up with some of my ex-coworkers, and then I probably use Twitter to follow my favorite stars, etc. Journals, it's the opposite. 75% of journalists use Twitter as their, their top kind of professional social network. Uh, after that, Facebook, and then after that, only 2 or 3% for LinkedIn. Then we asked journalists how many times you check Twitter a day, or how many times you check Twitter. We said you check it once a month, once a week, once a day, several times a day. Of course, 86% said several times a day. We got several snarky tweets from journalists Saying the question should really be in how many times you check Twitter a minute, once a minute, twice a minute, several times a minute, once every second. So they're using it all the time. That's a huge place to engage with journalists, and I'll talk about that a bit more soon. We decided to ask journalists, why do you reject the pitch? Why don't you take a PR pitch when someone emails you to cover something? Uh, aside from the irrelevant subject matter. So of course, you know, if you pitch a journalist and they're a sports journalist, you have to write out your enterprise IT software, it's going to get rejected. But next to that, why do they reject? Number one reason, lack of personalization. Now, I'm sure we've all gotten people trying to sell us, or you get an email and you can tell it's a form email. Journalists get hammered by PR emails that are clearly not customized, that were clearly sent to 100 other people. So number one is personalize your pitch. Up next, when should you pitch? This is. Uh, Awful news for any morning people. I mean, anyone who's not a morning person like myself. But journalists want to get pitched in the morning. 43% uh, between 9 and 11 a.m. 27% want it even earlier, between 6 and 9 a.m. So taken together, vast majority of journalists want to pitch before 11 a.m. We found, anecdotally, talking to journalists, the reason is that when they wake up in the morning, they have a huge problem. What do I write about today? So if you can help them with that, you can give them good ideas for what to write about, you're making their life easier. By the afternoon, they have a very different huge problem, which is how do I meet my deadline? And they're scrambling to meet, meet their deadline or their quota of how many posts they have to make by the end of the day. And then if you interrupt them with a pitch, you're, you're a burden. You're taking them away from what they need to do to be successful. So pitch in the morning. And also be conscious of whatever time zone they're in. So it's great if you're pitching someone on the West Coast, and you can uh, kind of pretend that you're a morning person out here and really do it late morning. But if you're pitching someone in London, you should probably spend it the night before or wake up really early. Next, keep your pitch short. So I think a lot of us, if you Google like 101 of PR, you find out how to write a press release, and you're told, write this press release as though it's an article, write it 500 to 1,000 words. Include the who, what, where, when, and why. So that's actually the exact opposite that you should do when you're reaching out to a journalist. Uh, we found most of them want it in two to three sentences. The next biggest group wants just two to three, uh, or sorry, two to three paragraphs or two to three sentences. Almost no one wants it 500 to 1,000 words. And we find what really works best is a really short email. You don't have to answer every question, you don't have to give the whole story. All you have to do is get the journalists interested enough to know more to reply with questions. Then you can fill them out on everything. So think about your story, like what makes it the most interesting? I recently helped a uh, new entrepreneur where she was a former engineer at Benz Runway. She pitched journalists, though, with this 500-word pitch. 
kind of describing what it was. And she actually hid her title as founder because she wanted it to appear it being from a bigger company. So we worked on our pitch, we boiled it down to like two to three sentences, and the pitch was just a former engineer at the runway, I'm going to start my own passion startup, are you interested in talking? That's it, it was interesting, you don't get, you know, there's a lot of credibility, former female engineer, who went to runway launching their own passion startup, that's enough for a tech journalist, they get it, they want to know more. She sent that pitch out, she went from a 10% response rate to over 50%, ended up getting placed in 10 different publications, all as a single founder, <laughs> No budget for PR. Uh, another thing we've seen is I was just telling you about how important it is, how much time journalists spend on Twitter. Yet there's a nuance here. A lot of people say, does this mean I should pitch on Twitter? In 99% of the case, definitely not. 93% of journalists want pitches by email still. Not, not email, definitely not phone, not fax. It's email is how they communicate. Yet, Journalists, they want to be followed, that same 93% want to be followed by the journalists or by who's ever pitching it. And I think that this, this kind of creates this dichotomy where on one hand, Twitter is a great place to build the relationship with journalists. So I think it's extremely important before you pitch to journalists, follow them, ideally weeks before, not days before. Interact with them on Twitter, favorite them, answer their questions, retweet them. All these journalists who can make a huge impact on your company, who can write you know, their front page journal, a front page article in the Wall Street Journal, they might only have 500, 1,000 followers themselves. So if you interact with them on Twitter, they're really going to notice that. Yet the actual transaction is much better over email because it's private. If you pitch a lot of journalists over Twitter, guess what? They're going to notice. They're going to look at your Twitter feed and see that that same story just went out to 20 other journalists. It's awkward. They can't ask questions. So in almost all cases, pitch by email, with the exception either, sometimes journalists explicitly say on Twitter, hey, I'm looking for a source. I had a, I got a great press for us in CNET where I saw journalists tweeted out, anyone going to South By to show off your company in the PR marketing space, I just tweeted back at him. Then he gave me his email, then we had a phone call, then I got the coverage. So there the initial interaction started on Twitter, but it's because he asked for it. And a very small portion of journalists, too, will uh, say in their Twitter bio, you can pitch me by DM, and in that case, by all means, do it. But the average journalist, they just want to pitch by email. But a short email, like I was saying, in the morning. And uh, next up, we probably all had the case where you email a journalist, you get no response back, so then the big question is, like, did they consciously reject me and not like my pitch, or were they just busy that? Good news here is over 70% of journalists are okay with at least one follow-up. Most are okay with just one follow-up. But you can follow up with the journalist, and I found who well, pitch journalists, nothing happens. They just reply to that original email and say, hey, just check if you got my last email. And sure enough, you know, the response rate goes up from usually something like 20 to 30% to 70 80% if it's a good pitch. The other thing I found is good is um, if you created that connection with them on Twitter, and you follow them and they follow you, you can email them, and a lot of times just direct messaging them and saying, hey, did you get my email from two days ago? We'll get a great response. I've done that many times with a lot of success. Up next, we found that journalists, they really care about getting their stories shared on social media. It's this really powerful metric for journalists now. Over 76% said they're under more pressure now than ever before to get their content shared. And what does that mean for you? You should really think about after you get the press. It used to be that when you get the press, your job was done, right? You cut out that article, you send it to your client, you send it to your mom, you couldn't control how many people saw the newspaper, so, so that was it. But now that you get the press, your job's only halfway done. And this is where I think PR department and marketing department can really work together. It's not a fixed number how much how many people are going to see that story about you. You can promote it many different ways. You can tweet it out. You can get it shared. And not only is it important because you want to have people see good press about you, but it's important to keep up the relationship with the journalists because the journalist writes about your company and nobody reads it, nobody shares it. And then you contact them six months later when you have your new feature launch or your new round of funding. They're not going to be that interested in covering it. Whereas if they write about you, 
you know, they shoot to the top of the leaderboard at their outlet that their story is the most shared. They can see it's generating a lot of attention. They're going to look out for you in their inbox and fight to get the exclusive on your next story. So really think about how you get that story shared. We took it even further to ask journalists what makes a story shareable. Number one thing journalists thought made a story shareable is does the story have a good image with it? Because now, of course, when a story is shared on Twitter, on Facebook, etc., it grabs a thumbnail image, and that thumbnail image will really drive whether or not people see it. So really think about anything you're launching. How can you create a great visual for it? And so maybe it's a photo of your team. Maybe it's an infographic you make out of a stat. Maybe it's a, you know, your offices, screenshots of your product. But do something that will create a great visual you can send out with that news release. And so to sum up, when you're pitching out there and you want to get press for what you're doing, Really customize it. Much better to find five or ten journalists that your story is a great match for and put a lot of effort into that initial email rather than just blasting hundreds of journalists with the same thing. Uh, make sure you pitch at the right time. Pitch in the morning, wherever the morning is for that journalist. Keep your pitch super short. Relentlessly edit it down. That will make a huge difference. Interact with the journals over Twitter, over social media, well in advance of your pitch. So, when I say alternative media, think about like all the newsletters we all subscribe to. All the newsletters we actually all read. Um, like Cash and Bill, a subscriber, is like some hundred thousand people who see our newsletter. And I feel that the inbound includes from small business experts, other reporters who want to get in front of that sort of audience. Um, when we were at Thrive, That's a great point. Uh, I'll say also I found SEO really ties into PR here too. A lot of times you have experts on your team and you want to get them quoted. Uh, if you can get them writing stories that will rank high, uh, it's really powerful for journalists because a lot of journalists, when they need an expert and they're at their start, they do like any of us. They Google for information. They reach out to people. So there are a lot of areas, and I think increasingly more and more, where all these functions like uh, social media, SEO, uh, content amplification that are more marketing areas, drive PR, and then of course the PR do the backlinks and everything that's created from that drive marketing. So you know, more and more you see kind of that funnel between them. Yes? So um, the only thing we're missing is the email address for the journalists. Uh, can they detect it like going for help or do they share it willingly and say, how to find it? Or do you say the same thing? Sure. So how to find email addresses for journalists. So one, of course, you can subscribe to MuckRack. We have every journalist email address in there and make it easy. But I'll, I'll give you all the secrets too. So a lot of journalists, a lot of journalists, they don't guard them too jealously. Some put it in their Twitter bios. A lot of times you Google for the journalist's name. It's out there somewhere, maybe even on their personal page. Google their name, then email. Some publications list that Wall Street Journal has the journalist's email address at the bottom of every one. And then how many people here know about the email permutator? Oh, man. Nobody. This is going to be my top tip. So there's a, a great uh, service, email permutator. Uh, you can just email me, greg at mockrack.com, and I'll send you the link. Or just Google email permutator, and I'm sure you'll find it. So you just type in an email address, and it creates every permutation of that email. So you type in Joe Smith, New York, you know, the, the domain of their publication, NY Times. It'll give you joe.smith at nytimes.com, jsmith at nytimes.com, every, every possible permutation. You copy those all into Gmail in your inbox, and then you download. How many people here have Reportive? Since acquired by and ruined by LinkedIn, it's, it's still pretty. And I've had three services I love ruined by LinkedIn. <laughs> Andrew here can join me in the commiseration club. But um, so you dump all those into your into the two field in an email in Gmail. You have Reportive installed, and then when you just mouse over each email address, 
if that email address is the person's real email address, 90% of the time it'll show you their LinkedIn profile on the right hand side and then you go bingo, I have the, the right email for that person and then you can email them. So there are a bunch of ways to dig up an email address. I don't know why I'm telling you all this and <laughs> pleading the absolute need for you to subscribe to Muckrack, but we, we do a lot of stuff aside from this that too, so uh, I have to give it up. Yeah. Uh, different story each time yeah. it happened. So what she did was she searched Muckrack for rent the runway and other like very specific terms where you're like, if the person covered rent the runway, they'd probably be interested in what the next employee from there is doing basically in the same industry. And she'd actually, but she wouldn't just search and make the media list in Muckrack, but she actually read the stories that these journals did and the tweets they made about the industry and crafted it to show like you know, in one case, it, it was the person covered up the runway, so it's in place, I covered this, I'm doing this now. Whereas another one, it tweeted about, it was something we get feedback on your closet, you know, and, and with what you should wear. So, you know, it was someone who might have talked about that problem that they had. I saw you wrote this story about this problem you have. I built a software that, stuck, that solves that. So rather than send out that email to 100 people by sending it out to just a good handful, with the right pitch, you got a really high response rate. Yeah. Um, we're kind of looking at investing heavily in PR strategy right now, internal or external. Do we bring it in-house or do we go outside to an external firm? That's all, always a question, internal or external or PR. My general, so I, you know, a lot of it breaks down to your specific needs and I've seen people be successful both ways. My general recommendation though to the startups that haven't done it before is to get good at it internally before you bring on someone external. And the reason is that it's hard to manage an outside function when you don't understand it. Like imagine you, know, you hire an accountant, but you don't have any understanding of bookkeeping. Like it's gonna be hard to know uh, what's going on in that function of your business. And secondly, it's that a lot of PR, you know, there's all the functional things that I talked about, which is how to go pitch. And, and that's what PR firms, uh, a good PR firm is great at, a lot are good ones are great at that. But the hard part is to recognize what the good story is in your company. So a lot of times what happens is that, you know, you think the story is one thing, like, you know, everyone gets an atom with their own company. So I might think the story of Muckrack is we're providing the best damn software ever for this industry. But of course, that's not a credible story to any journal. Yet a lot of times the stories end up being that someone had this unique founding story or that there's this, you know, customer case study that that's deep in the company that could be turned into a news story, or just one of your employees has a fascinating background they're bringing to it. So I find what, what we kind of lack a lot of times with the agency is that unless you're going to spend a tremendous amount of time with that agency and they're going to get really deep into the organization, they're not going to really know the story about you. So they'll just go for the obvious opportunities that anyone can get through your funding event, your new product launch. So I think I think what's really important is for someone in your company, it could be that you hire a dedicated PR person, it could be that one of you just tries doing it for a month or two before you outsource it, but to have someone in the company who really has that kind of nose for what's news, to kind of bring that internally and surface those stories, and then use the agency to pour gasoline on the fire. We have time for one more question. Okay. Oh, or, or, you know, I'm sorry, we, we just had someone who had an ask a question before. Um, I was just sure, so there seems to be a disconnect. All the, the, the media likes getting the pitches over email, so they spend every minute on Twitter. Are they just checking out Kardashians all day, or where, why, why is that? Yes, yeah, so why do journals spend all day on Twitter? Yeah, they're not, they're not, not trying to get their story. It, it's a few different uh, reasons. One is that they use it to find, they actually do use it to find stories because they're following a lot of their sources. So they, they don't want to be pitched on Twitter, but if they cover Salesforce and Mark Benioff tweets something, they need to know about it that second. They can't wait until later. 
And another big part is that, I mean, how many of us Google or pay attention to our competitors sometimes? We may not want to admit to. So, so they do this all the time because all their kind of competitors, their rival journals are on Twitter tweeting all the time. So, you know, they want to know what, they're, what the competition's up to, also their colleagues and their friends. And, you know, that and, you know, God knows why else, maybe they're manic, but that's where they are. So that's, that's the place to build a relationship. Thank you so much.